What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of Life Imitating Movies. I am Brad Hammerly. Over there is my co-host, Mitch. There you go. He said, what's up? So uh, first and foremost, man, how was your week? Doing all right? Yeah, hanging in there. You know, we're at month, uh, whatever this is, of the pandemic. So just still just trying to be smart, be safe. And, you know, we're, we're going to get through this. Yeah, man. Super, no Super Bowl parties this week sucks, but we'll we'll get through it. You know, you got that Zoom Super Bowl party. But um, so let's jump right into it, dude. So this week, our opening question, I wanted to, you know, last two weeks ago, we did what movie makes you laugh the most. Last week, we did what movie makes you cry. So this week, I wanted to kind of jump into the big guns, which is what's your top five movies all time? And so this is something you and I have discussed before, and you we've we've have our like top top ten of like different categories. But I wanted to hone in on the the top five movies that you kind of consider the the ones you can go to at any given like they're just your favorites. So uh, with that, I'll launch into my list, which uh, number one is a movie called Arlington Road. All right, number two, a movie called Interstellar. Number three, a little movie called La La Land. Yeah. Number four, a little movie called A Few Good Men. And number five, a movie which will get a lot of play this week, Joker. And so those movies, all right, Arlington Road for me, I saw in 98, and that was, I've been obsessed with this idea of you don't know who people are. Like you walk through the mall. You could be walking next to a serial killer. You could be walking next to the person who invents the cure for cancer. You could be walking next to a guy who has people tied up in their basement. You know, it's just this notion of you don't know who people are. Even my neighbors here, I, I don't really know my neighbors. They could be horrible human beings and the best people ever. So Arlington Road for me, is it's a movie with Jeff Bridges, Tim Robbins, Joan Cusack, and one of my all-time favorite performances, Hope Davis. And it's just about a guy, Jeff Bridges, teaches a class in terrorism. And he suspects his next door neighbor, Tim Robbins, of being a terrorist. And it's just, for my money, it's 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 the theme I'm obsessed with, which made it my favorite movie. So number two, Interstellar, was just, the score for that movie is my all-time favorite score. Hans Zimmer, best score ever. They used organs. There's a documentary on the Blu-ray about how they did the score. Best score ever. And I actually wrote a paper on it. I've seen the movie like five or six times because it's a movie that you can't watch once and understand. You got to watch it a few times. And I've read the script. And and so I, I actually wrote a paper on it just for myself because I'm a nerd like that, that to, to, to go through the ideas of what that movie is with in terms of gravity and love and, and wormholes. And, all. and I bought the book by uh, Kip Thorne that explores the actual themes of black holes and time travel so good uh so three la la land it's just you know not to get too heavy i saw it uh, it came out after my brother had passed away and it became a movie that uh, my mom and i were able to just watch and enjoy and be happy watching it because the music is is so good and I just, I love that movie. It's the music is, for my money, it's the best soundtrack. Interstellar is the best score. La La Land's the best soundtrack. A Few Good Men, that's probably the movie I can watch the most out of any movie ever. Like, I just love that movie. Now, I did the thing that you shouldn't do. I, I'm an actor, we'll say. I'm, you know, I've done background work. I'm in Screen Actors Guild and stuff. But I went to an audition and they asked me to do a monologue. My dumbass did the monologue from A Few Good Men. I did the Jack Nicholson monologue. Uh, wasn't until after I did that that I went online and read the one monologue you should never do an audition, Jack Nicholson from A Few Good Men. Obviously, I didn't get the part. And Joker, Joker came out last year, and it's just, it's a masterpiece, man. It is, we'll get more into that later, but it's just a masterpiece of a movie, so... How about with you, Mitch? What are your top five? So I took the easy way out with this one. Um, I know you're always kind of pushing me for the the clear one through five, but I almost kind of did the same thing I usually do when we talk about this. And it's the same thing that like uh, the YouTube channel Cinefix does, which I would highly recommend if you're a movie fan at all to anybody 
watching or listening, but they do like a kind of top uh, 10, but not like a definitive one through 10 ranking, but like depending on the video, a top 10 in like each category or by genre. So that's kind of what I did. So in no particular order, but these are, you know, my favorites, like some of my top favorites still. We got first The Dark Knight, Halloween, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, Mean Girls, and Silence of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. And the reason I picked some of those, just rapid fire, just blow through them. So Dark Knight, I would probably say this is my favorite movie ever. It, and I'm going to say this is like, you know, for the different genres that are represented here, that it's the superhero genre for that pick of my top five, because let's be honest, it's its own genre these days. And, you know, what else can you say about this movie? I think it's nearly perfect. I don't think any movie is perfect in my book, but this one for me comes pretty close. And I just absolutely love Heath Ledger's The Joker. Um, so my next one, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. I would argue, and I bought this up last week, that it is the best action movie of all time. It's a great blend of practical and special effects, like the perfect blend of the two. It still holds up today. It's got classic one-liners, and it's just you know a true sequel where it took the great concept of the good original one and just built upon it and made it even better. So Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Um, Halloween which is my kind of like top horror movie. And it came close between this and the witch from 2015, but ultimately I had to go with uh, the original Halloween from 1978 because it just revolutionized the slasher genre, almost pretty much invented it. And Michael Myers is still my favorite, you know, kind of the like horror villain, mass killer, slasher villain, whatever you want to call it. And it just, it has so much to offer and it's still, something I watch every Halloween to this day. Um, and then number four is I kind of pick for comedy and it's Mean Girls because I, there are two types of people in this world, the people that like this movie and liars because everyone, everyone has at least parts of this movie that they like. And it's just amazing how it reaches so many different types of people and so many audiences. And it's just almost every single line of this movie is so quotable. And it's just, you know, funny and it's just a great balanced look at that high school click system. And it's just classic comedy, like hats off to Tina Fey for, for creating it pretty much. And then last is silence of the lambs, which I kind of picked as like my thriller genre representative. And this, I already talked about this movie on another episode too, but it's just, you know, the dark story and, you know, the change of pace protagonist where it's usually a male and it's, you know, a female and there are themes of, you know, growing up in a, in a man's world and trying to make a name for herself, but it's just such a good, you know, story about a, you know, cop and robber, you know, just simplify it. And, you know, Anthony Hopkins is Hannibal Lecter. What more can you ask for? All right. All right. So let's get into the meat of this episode. So um, first story we're going to do is probably the biggest story of the last couple of weeks, which was if you followed news at all, you knew that, um, GameStop stock went through the roof. Um, it was an interesting story. I didn't understand it at all at first because I didn't. I didn't. I just didn't get it. Luckily, my friend is uh, pretty good at uh, breaking down and was just now getting into the stock market and stuff, so he broke it down pretty good for me. But you know, I found a story online. Um, Time, you know, reputable Time magazine did a pretty good breakdown of of how how this story happened, how this story came to be, which is essentially GameStop is a retail store. So those video games, obviously retail stores aren't doing that great before the pandemic, but especially in the pandemic. And uh, what happens is Wall Street hedge fund people, they short a stock. And by shorting a stock is they, they borrow stocks from a company to set, to bet on them, dropping below a certain price and at which point they sell those stocks to another person then they buy back the stocks at a lower rate give back the stocks to the original lender and pocket the difference in the stock price and 
that's what these hedge funds wanted to do, and they could potentially make billions of dollars doing that. But what happened is Reddit, some people on Reddit, some stock savvy people on Reddit said pretty much F you to these hedge fund people and said buy GameStop stock so that the price goes up. And what happens is when they do that, these 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 hedge fund people are still on the hook for the price of the of the stock to the lenders. And by the stock price going up, they have to give the difference. So instead of making billions, they potentially lose billions of dollars. So first, did you have anything about this story? Are you a stock guy or anything? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty financially illiterate when it comes to this kind of stuff. So I read the article and it's still I still struggled with it a little bit, but I get the gist of what's going on. So, you know, it's a shame that there's such an uproar now that these hedge fund people are losing money when they regularly make money and the everyday people are now making money and it's, you know, suddenly a travesty. So, I'm on the I'm on Reddit side mostly. Uh, look, there are two sides to every story, but that's, you know, kind of who I'm rooting for in this scenario. And this is this is still ongoing. We're not done with this. We're going to get multiple adaptations like movies and TV shows about yeah. this thing. So um, so this might be, you know, one of the few times that you and I might pick the same movie because I have a feeling on this article or another kind of story that we pulled from the past week coming up later in the episode that this might be one of the first times that we, we have the same movie. So, so let me hear what you picked. Well... There's only one movie I could think of that you have to watch in order to understand any of this. The Big Short. Yep, same movie, right? No? No, you, you know what? It, I, it, it, it could only have been that movie or the one I picked, and I'll get to that in a second, but I think you could guess what it is. But let's hear about uh, The Big Short from your perspective first. Yeah, so The Big Short, for me, it's one of the, it is one of the best movies ever made, I think. You know, it's just Adam McKay... I believe became the first ever Saturday Night Live alum to win an Oscar when he won Best Original Screenplay for uh, Big Short. You know, it's a guy coming from Anchorman, Talladega, uh, these Will Ferrell comedies. And, and actually, you saw you kind of saw the groundwork for this movie with um, the other guys. Did you see the other guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other guys is a so, good comedy. Yeah, yeah. And, and so you see the groundwork for it because the other guys is all about people, you know, stop, people being shady business people. And But this movie is all about um, the 2008 housing market. Christian Bale plays a guy who who he seems he might be autistic. I'm not really sure, but he, he he's he's good at stock market and he tells his clients to short the housing market, which, as we all know, collapsed in 2008 and people made billions of dollars off of it and it's and it's one of the i I also like the way it's such a complex story with the big short and because of adam mckay and because of the he's just a funny guy and the way he writes is funny you know have you first off have you seen the big short no this has been another one that has been like sitting on my list forever that i am interested in i'm sure once i see it i'll like it so you know i will get to this one at some point sure so one, the great thing about the Big Short is they'll they'll have scenes where they explain something so complex about the stock market that you and I are just we're not going to get because we're not those people. And then he cuts to like the most famous one is it's Margot Robbie who's not in the movie but she does a cameo. She's in a bathtub with bubbles and she explains what they just said in layman's terms. And it's such a genius, like it's. I don't know, piece of filmmaking or explanation it's so phenomenally well done that it, it's just a great man and if you want to understand the stock market man that is the movie to watch and you know a lot of people think we might be heading towards a new uh housing market uh crash because of with coronavirus and you know uh, uh, uh evictions have been put on a moratorium because of coronavirus so it's we we are potentially heading towards another crash of the of the uh of the housing market, but to understand stocks, man, that's the, that's the one to watch. I, 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 I'm drawing a blank on what movie you could, maybe I'm thinking boiler room maybe or something to that effect, but I, I'm drawing a blank on what you picked. Yeah. First, just wrapping up about the big short, I feel like hearing about this movie, you do need to watch it twice just to get a, a grasp on what's being explained, but also, you know, some stuff that maybe may not make sense as you're watching it in real time. But when you go back and view the whole thing, having already seen it, that it would make more sense and maybe do a better job of explaining things. So I'm looking forward to watching that one day, but 
I thought that that was the clear kind of like number one pick and I didn't pick it because I hadn't seen it yet, but the movie that closely relates to this kind of article and situation going on, I think is the number two clear choice. And that is the Wolf of Wall Street. And, you know, I picked this one too, because the real Jordan Belfort actually kind of came out during the week and tried to give advice to people and said, hold on to GameStop, don't sell, which, you know, taking advice from the real life version of that guy, probably not the the best piece of advice, but, um, but the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, great movie. When I was kind of picking up my top five, this was kind of up there with the handful of things that I kind of wrote down and narrowed it down to. So, you know, it's a long one, but it's really great. It's a classic kind of Martin Scorsese, almost like a, you know, like a life story, like one of those long kind of epic movies he does about like the rise and fall of somebody. And, you know, Jordan Belfort, make no mistake, like some of his other characters in his other movies is a criminal, but Leonardo DiCaprio plays him so great that you just can't help but but be on his side and kind of root for him a little bit to to screw people out of money. But and it's really a shame that he didn't win the Oscar for this because he went all out for the movie Leonardo DiCaprio did and he lost the Oscar this particular year, I believe, to Matthew McConaughey in Dallas Buyers Club, who actually was in this movie as well. So, you know, it's a shame that he didn't get the Oscar for this probably should have but it's still a great movie start to finish it's a long one but it's it's not maybe a movie that you would want to watch with with family though with with close relatives yeah wolf of wall street man it's just good good movie and dicaprio man he plays those because he played he played jordan belfort there and then earlier you know he played um frank abagnale for catch me if you can so dicaprio i think i've said it before he's 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 uh my, my Mount Rushmore favorite actor, so he's, he's number two on that list. So our next story from the week is another big one because it was unveiled that, um, you know, Stacey Abrams was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. And if you don't really know who Stacey Abrams is or you kind of heard her name but don't really know much about her, um, she ran for, I believe it was the governor of Georgia not long ago, a year or two ago, and lost a close race. But... She's still a big figurehead in terms of voting rights, especially for minorities and African-Americans and really mobilized people to help get out and vote in this past election back in uh, fall of 2020, when it was a tough time for people to be able to get out and vote who were being cautious and for people who just didn't know what was, what was going on because of the turmoil of the, ro- of the world with the pandemic. So uh, Stacey Abrams, you know, big voting rights activist. And, you know, it's great to see her kind of receive recognition for that with this award, at least, you know, that's my opinion. But I'm glad to see that, you know, her work is being recognized, even if she's not a government official kind of real uh, public figurehead, she's still a symbolic public figure. Yeah, man. So Stacey Abrams is one of those people who I'd seen on Colbert all the time, you know, before the, you know, when she was running for governor and stuff. And she's one of those people who's just like, I like her. She's, she's, she seems down to earth. She seems funny. She seems cool and everything. So I, I, I always, I always liked her. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not sure if there's a clear cut kind of movie pick to go along with this article, but I think that the one I picked comes pretty close and that's Remember the Titans. And because this is a movie, it was filmed in Georgia, first of all, which is, you know, the state that she kind of lives in and works hard in and represents. And obviously the subject material is kind of talking about a lot of the same issues that she stands for and that we're still kind of talking about as a country, even after all this time where you're dealing with um, different rights for different races and how we perceive one another and remember the Titans doesn't really pull any of those punches because it takes place in the sixties in Virginia, which was obviously a hot territory for the civil rights movement. So, and that's not even talking about how great of a sports movie it is. Um, You know, it's one of my favorites. I would say, if not my favorite sports movie, it's definitely top three. And, you know, Denzel Washington just of course gives such a great performance and gives so many inspiring speeches that I'm sure clips from that movie are used to motivate motivate real life athletic teams across the country, and it's one that I can still watch over and over again. So 
remember the Titans, you know, just great movie. And I think kind of represents and it's on the nose about some of the stuff in this article and some of the stuff that Stacey Abrams stands for. Yeah, man. Remember the Titans is definitely one of the best football movies ever made sports movies probably as well. I haven't seen that one in a while, but it's Denzel. I don't think there's a Denzel movie. I don't like, so, you know, then you got Ethan Supley in it. I believe he's in that. And if you know Ethan Supley, he went from being massively huge and now he's like bodybuilder. Gives me hope. But yeah, remember the time? That's, yeah, I mean, you watch all these movies about race relations back in the day. And you, you, you know, before, before four years ago, I'll say, you didn't think that our country was kind of in that same boat. And then four years goes by and you're like, oh, right, we haven't made much progress, maybe some, but not as much as we need. But uh, I, I enjoy movies like that. I enjoy football movies that tell stories that I am not privy to in my own life. And, and Remember the Titans is, is, a, is a good one. It's a very entertaining. It's a Disney movie, so it is a little sanitized, I think. Um, but it's still a phenomenal flick. All right. So with that, you know, the theme of this one is the Nobel Prize. There's a movie that came out last year about the Nobel Peace Prize, and it's called The Wife. Uh, I actually don't own it. I have a screener somewhere, but I couldn't find it. But it's The Wife with Glenn Close. And basically what the movie is about is um, Glenn Close is a woman whose husband is getting the Nobel Peace Prize. And so the movie takes place over the weekend of the Nobel Peace Prize. And it's basically about how she wrote what he is being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for. And she's kind of always been the wife to this, this man's success. And, uh, and it's, it's an excellent movie. Excellent. Before. Like Glenn Close was nominated. She was presumed front runner for the Oscar last year. It, it might've been two years ago, but it was, she was the presumed front runner for the Oscar, but um, Olivia, it was two years ago. Olivia Coleman won the Oscar for um, the, uh, the favorite. So so um it's it's and it's just about yeah this woman she, you can see her performance isn't a lot of words but it, the performance is all in her face and how miserable she is and how she's kind of just sick of being you know the the arm to this man who gets all the accolades and he didn't even earn them she did all the work and it's a it's a it's a if you ever want to study acting that would be one i would recommend watching for glenn close's performance yeah, she's a really versatile actress. You know, she's played men, you know, before on screen. And she's obviously like played women characters. But, you know, so she's very talented and she's very versatile. But, you know, I think the premise of this sounds really interesting as well, because it sounds like a really niche issue being, you know, presented here, but one that is still important, which is the whole, you know, the woman behind the man getting credit for somebody else's work you know off the top of my head i can't really think about a lot of movies that deal with that firsthand you know there are instances of that in movies i've seen but i can't really think of that many off the top of my head that like that's the the issue at the forefront of the movie so it sounds like a good perspective type of movie you know to understand where somebody's coming from and you know again you kind of talked about it a little bit earlier with remember the titans where it's understanding somebody else's point of view. So maybe it's not a situation that's happened to you or me before, but it still sounds important to, to kind of see that and be a part of it with this movie. Yeah, man. It's just one of those movies that I don't know if the mainstream public will, they probably go, this is boring. But if you are into watching phenomenal performances with just heavy like I said, not a lot of dialogue. The performance is in her face is in how she characterizes everything. You know, great, great movie, great performance. Check it out. All right, so let's move on to the next story, which is, uh, <clears throat> I think, a theme maybe with my stories. I think maybe you picked a couple before, but I, I tend to like UFO stories, man. I, I, I am intrigued by the vastness of space, hence the reason Interstellar is number two on my list. It's just intriguing so there was a story that came out of hawaii last week where there was a bright blue light in the sky 
and nobody knew what it was. The FAA was called and they said there were no airplanes, no downed aircrafts, no missing aircrafts in the area. And the blue light was there for a while and it just fell into the ocean. And it's people took the video, uh, you know, cell phone video of it. And it was, um, it was, uh, it was, it was weird looking, man. It was just, you know, a weird blue light just in the middle of the sky. So, so first and foremost, I want to ask, have you ever think you've seen something in the sky that was a little off too with that roll of the eyes? Do you believe in UFOs or aliens or any of that stuff? All right. So to give as, as, clear and concise of an answer as possible because this is a a big discussion topic this ties into like a grand you know life in the universe and aliens and all that kind of stuff and i'm sure there are shows about that so i'll um i'll just answer by saying that have i personally seen something like this in the sky before no and but do i believe that there's life beyond our planet somewhere in the galaxy or the universe absolutely is it intelligent life, especially how we perceive aliens in like movies and TV shows? Maybe, maybe not, but, you know, speculate away if you, you know, check out this story and watch, you know, these, these clips of the videos. This one, it's interesting because the light fell into the ocean. And so, you know, it's like, all right, so do we have something, do we have something alien now in our oceans or something? It's kind of like okay is that coming on shore is it kind of like war of the worlds where maybe they come to earth and they just die from the common cold or whatever so with my movie pick for this one i just went with a movie i think i've told you about before that i think i told you to watch and it's a found footage movie called phoenix forgotten and phoenix forgotten is in um i think it was like 90 95 there was uh lights over arizona and this is this is true this is the true part of the story lights over arizona and people took video can nobody knew what it was and then from there this movie has these kids go out and try and uh go to area 51 um in the nevada desert to is it, it was one of those but um phoenix whatever and so they go and try and find where these aliens are and stuff and it's it's in terms of found footage movies which some of them are absolute garbage this one I remember seeing a couple of years ago. I was just immediately like, that was good, man. It was creepy. It had a phenomenal ending. It was just, it was just good. And I've told you to watch this movie several times over the few years. And I'm going to bet if I were to put money on it, you haven't seen it. No, not this one. But <clears throat> I remember a little bit ago, you recommended another alien movie. And, you know, there, there's a few of them that you recommended that I check out. And it's on a, a list of like, you know, a handful of movies to watch um, that are, aren't really on like a streaming service. But um, I did check out the other one you kind of recommended a while back called Fire in the Sky. And yeah. that one I kind of told you about after I saw it. it. It's a so-so movie, but the alien abduction scene is really good. So, you know do with that what you will you know if you're listening to this and you like maybe i should check it out maybe i won't so look it up it's I, i'd never heard of it before you recommended it but um i will check this one out eventually i do agree with you that there are some really garbage found footage movies out there so you know if you say it's good i believe you i'll check it out eventually but you know there are just it's really tricky to do a really good found footage movie I agree. I agree. Yeah. Fire in the sky was that movie for me was, I saw it when I was a kid, it came out in 93 based on a true story about Travis something who gets abducted in the woods or whatever. And that movie, when I was a kid scared the hell out of me, I mean, legitimately couldn't sleep at night, scared me seeing it now, you know, as an adult, the special effects have gone down a little bit. The story is more about the search for the guy versus the uh, actual, the actual abduction. But when it first came out in 93, man, the ending of that movie whew, scared the crap out of me. Yeah, and it's great because uh, found footage is a perfect segue into my movie that I picked for this because, you know, an article about UFOs, aliens, there's a million different movies out there like that. But I picked mine because it's relevant not only to the article, but it has a, a sequel coming out now that was just announced, and that is the original Cloverfield. And... Mm -hmm. Cloverfield, I think, is is a is a good found footage movie, you know, not only because of the way it was marketed, which was, 
you know, kind of famous and that, you know, it led people to speculate and go crazy with what it was about before it was released. But um, it's a found footage alien monster movie, which I'm, I always love a good monster movie. And this one is a good one. And a sequel to this was just announced, I believe, during the week where they're going to do a sequel to the first Cloverfield. And this one won't be in found footage. So what that means is these other Cloverfield spinoff movies where are like adjacent to the original ones, which are 10 Cloverfield Lane and the Cloverfield Paradox, both of which I liked. 10 Cloverfield Lane I thought was the best of the three because it's just really well done and plays with a lot of um, themes of suspicion and, you know, just all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I'm glad that this movie is finally getting a proper sequel because while I liked the three existing Cloverfield movies, as they are, I've always been dying to get a proper sequel to any one of them because I want to see what happens with the continuation of the story from these different characters and these different scenarios in this mixed Cloverfield universe. So Cloverfield, um, you know, what did you think when you when you saw the original, if you did in theaters or on home video? Yeah, man. So I actually remember seeing the trailer for the first time where it was attached to the first Transformers movie, the very first one. And the trailer came out and it was, you didn't know what it was. You're just, cause that, that one was like, what, what is this? And that's a JJ Abrams thing. Cause the same thing happened a few years later with super eight. Um, and so when it was, it came for the movie to come out, came out, I think January or something. I, I went to the theaters and saw, it, and that was the first of the modern era of found footage movie. Obviously Blair Witch Project in 99 was like the first found footage movie that really brought the genre to what, what it was. And then for like 10 years or something after that for a while, so that wasn't it footage or something until quote, quote, it came out. And that, and that was directed by what Matt Reeves, who's doing the Batman now. And, uh, you know, you had TJ Miller in it, um, from mean girls, you had, uh, I can't think of her name for life of me, but she was in it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Cloverfield is good, man. And I, I actually, that one did run through my brain when thinking about this story, because, you know, the thing falls into the ocean. And if you, the, the alien in that movie, they have a scene in the movie where. Think, that's, um, that's, that's the other part I was going to say where, you know, that was the other thing relating it to this story for me is because in the ending of the original Cloverfield, it's a blink and you'll miss it moment, but when the two protagonists, the guy and the girl, are in Coney Island and they kind of look out at the ocean for a second with the camera that they're using, and you can see in the background a satellite or something kind of fall into the ocean, and people speculate because they don't tell you for sure, but people speculate that that satellite that fell into the ocean and eventually kind of sunk and made its way down to this creature who was maybe sleeping on the ocean floor in a uh, trench or something that that satellite kind of knocked its head and kind of woke it up and started the events of the movie. So the next story here from the past week deals with Jeff Bezos stepping down as Amazon CEO. And, you know, he's not going to be gone from the company for good. He's just kind of taking a different role within the company and taking time to work on some of his other projects like, a charity and some of his other things that he's been interested in and wanted to spend more time on. So, um, you know, I haven't done a ton of reading on the background of their new CEO that he kind of appointed or has been given the role or worked his way up. You know, I'm not sure what the scenario is there behind the scenes, but, you know, a little bit of a big news story where, you know, Amazon, such a huge company, their CEO is kind of moving on to other things still within the company. But, you know, does this kind of It'll lead you to speculate about anything or, you know, what's going on with Amazon? No, not really. I mean, eventually everybody's got to step down. You know, Bill Gates ain't the CEO of Microsoft anymore either. I just was, I remember when Amazon first launched, it was, it was just a book company, an online book company. It's weird. You know, I'm now old enough to, to see the, that, you know, something that started as an internet book company become essentially uh, the biggest company 
of all time. It's just a weird makes me feel old too. I'm just like, oh, seeing this the world change essentially through Amazon. Well, we're old enough too to remember when Netflix, which is such a big company now, used to be just a DVD mailing service. So, you know, we're we're I think it's just the the fact that we're starting to get to that age where we have been around long enough to see some significant changes happen with some companies like this. Yeah, yeah, Netflix thing is that's one of those where I'm kicking myself because as you see, my library, I've always had a vast library. And I was like, oh, why didn't I start renting my movies back then? I could have done that. But, you know, in terms of Amazon and Bezos and everything, I mean, the guy's so rich that when his wife divorced him, she became what, like the second richest person in the world. I mean, that's that's a level of wealth there. You're just like, wow. So kind of switching gears, uh, the movie I picked to go along with this story, I kind of did what you talked about a few episodes ago where I ABC'd it. So, you know, A to B to C. So Amazon, the Amazon jungle. So with that, with that in mind, with that in mind, I picked the 2016 Jungle Book. And this, I will argue with people, has so far been the best live action Disney remake because frankly, at least in my opinion, a lot of them have not been that good. Like, you know, because it's just for me, there are a lot there are projects that don't need to exist. People love the source material that these live action remakes are being made from. So it's almost like a no win situation because if they deviate too much from the source material from the animated original, let's use Beauty and the Beast, for example. If Beauty and the Beast deviates too much from the original, then people will say it's nothing like it and it shouldn't be calling itself Beauty and the Beast. But if they just do a shot for shot live action remake of the animated one, then people say it's it's not bringing anything new to the table. So it's almost like a lose lose situation that they created for themselves by making these movies about what people are going to say about them. At least most people, because apparently they do make money. You know, the Lion King and Beauty and the Beast live action remakes made money and so did Aladdin and Mulan a little bit but it's just apparently people will still still go see these things but you know it kind of started a little bit back with this 2016 Jungle Book remake and I think this one is actually it's it's good you know it's directed by John Favreau who directed the live action Lion King but I think he did a much better job with this one about live action talking animals and it's got a great cast you have Bill Murray as Baloo Ben Kingsley as Bagheera, the panther. You have Idris Elba as Shere Khan, the tiger. Lupita Nyong'o as uh, Mowgli's wolf mother. And Christopher Walken as King Louie, the orangutan, the giant, you know, ape. So it's got a really good cast. They do a little bit of singing. Not, I don't think it's quite as many songs as the original. And by the way, uh, Scarlett Johansson as Ka, the snake, which I think was a really good kind of gender swap that they did. Because the original voice was was male, and it was the same guy who voiced Winnie the Pooh, which is funny. But, um, you know, it's just a really well done. It looks really great, and the animals actually kind of convey emotion in this one instead of the Lion King, where they just look like they're flapping their lips and not really have any emotion to them in, in, in that one. I enjoyed a Jungle Book. I haven't seen it in a while. I, it was a 3D one. I own the 3D Blu-ray. I, I believe that one had really strong 3D, too, so I was... I was a fan of that. And Jungle Book for me was never one of my favorite of the animated ones. Um, I enjoy it. Not one I watch all the time. And, and uh, you know, I enjoyed the big screen movie for what it was. Not one of my favorites, but good flick. Yeah, I mean, the original animated Jungle Book, I think a lot of people are maybe in that same boat. And I kind of am too, where people like it, but it's not necessarily their favorite. And I think that's what, if Disney really wants to keep making these live action remakes, which I really hope they don't, they don't just do it to exhaustion, but if they want to keep doing that, that they go back and pick movies like that, that aren't their most popular, and then redo them better in live action, which I think they kind of did with, with Jungle Book. So um, anyway, what was your kind of movie that you picked out related to this? Because, you know, I think this was a tough story to, to pick a movie for. Well. Wow. Yeah, to touch on it, I think the next one they're doing is The Little Mermaid, so that's another one will probably just be a shot for shot. But I'm looking forward to it. I love The Little Mermaid. So my movie um, is we're talking about a chairman stepping down. So I'm going to 
I'm going to bet dollars you've never seen this movie. I doubt, bet dollars most people haven't seen this movie. But are you familiar with a comedian, a hilarious comedian that I genuinely enjoy named Carrot Top? Yeah, I, you know, I, I know who he is, sure. So back in the day, he made a movie called Chairman of the Board. Okay. <laughs> it is it is a ridiculous movie where this guy is the nephew of a, of a guy who dies and with no family, he gets left. Uh, he becomes the chairman of this guy's Fortune 500 company. It is it's one of those like mid-90s, insanely dumb, yet I was a kid when I first saw it, and so I just enjoy it because it's so ridiculously dumb. And uh, it's it's just... It's just funny. I haven't seen it in a few years. I, you know, it's one of those movies that I'm not when I when I put on a movie at night. I generally like to watch something with some good substance. This is a movie where I'm like, I'll watch it on like Sunday afternoon. It's a Sunday afternoon movie. If you catch my drift when I say a Sunday a Sunday afternoon movie is like a dumb movie that you're just like you're just like I'll just throw this on in background or whatever. It's just it's just one of those types of movies lazy, so lazy off, sunday yeah pretty much man it's 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 just it's it's dumb but funny like and you know carrot top gets a rap you know people with his uh prop comedy but i think the guy's hilarious um and i think in the, in the past couple of years he's gotten his more respect i think if i believe he is the highest earning las vegas um act or something to that effect he's he's like He's a resident in Las, uh, Las Vegas for like the past 10, 20 years, and he, he sells out all the time. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Carrot Top fan. It's uh, the point of this podcast, I think, is to kind of give, give people the idea of movies that they may have never heard or seen and be like, yeah, I'll check it out. And I think that one is a, is a, is a pretty good one of you probably you've never heard of it, but check it out one day. All right, so my last story for this week is a story that came out not long ago about um, a man who was hiding in um, Chicago O'Hare Airport for three or four months because he was scared of the coronavirus. He didn't want to go out into the public because of his, he was scared of the coronavirus. And, um, you know, reading the article, guy's there for three months. He didn't sound malicious at all. Like he just he he sounded like he was just in. You know, maybe he might have mental issues or something. That the article actually didn't go into this guy's background or anything. It was just he seemed to genuinely be scared of of going out in the public because of this coronavirus. And you know, the judge in the case had said, you know, that what he did um, made him a danger to the community because of you know hiding and and taking somebody's credentials from the airport and hiding in a highly secure airport you know people scare of traveling in this world is a real thing for the past 20 years since september 11th and so um but even with that even with what she said she only set the guy's bail at a thousand bucks which to me says she actually didn't think that this guy was actually that dangerous because uh, bail, when bail, they said bail, they only have to pay 10% of that to actually get out of prison. And so 10% would be what, a hundred bucks. So, you know, she, she said that she, she was a danger. He was a danger to the community. He's not allowed to go back to the airport as part of his, uh, his bail or whatever, but setting his bail so low, let kind of made me think that the judge in this case was like, what you did was pretty horrible. It's a, it's a felony charge that he's on, but she didn't think it was like, you must stay in prison level bad. Yeah, I'm with you on this a little bit where the guy didn't sound that harmful, but I understand where they're coming from, law enforcement and the judge, where you can't hang out in the restricted area of an airport for three months at a time. Um, you know, that that certainly scares people and that would certainly worry me if I heard a story like that about an airport that I flew out of a lot, especially nowadays. But I think you're right, because in a post 9-11 world, we really can't mess around with something like that. We got to kind of come down hard on the people that are not where they're supposed to be at airports. So I understand that this guy probably didn't really sound that harmful and he was just kind of camping out, but I understand where law enforcement is coming from on this. So um, 
you know, there's a lot where you could go with this article, kind of picking a, a movie to go along with it. So, you know, what did you kind of pick out for this? So I'm going to be honest. I'll be surprised if we don't have the same movie on this one. Because for my money, there's only one movie. Okay, so I'm just guessing you went a little ABC on this one. Because there's one movie that was made that directly deals with a guy living in an airport. And that is The Terminal, Tom Hanks. And it's about a guy from uh, was it Croatia. He's from some country, some Middle Eastern country. And he gets... He goes to the, he flies into New York and he is, he doesn't have his credentials aren't in order. So he can't fly back to his home country because right now they're in a, in a, uh, in kind of a political upheaval. So he can't fly back to his home country and he's not allowed to enter United States. So he becomes essentially a, a citizen of nowhere and he lives in, uh, JFK airport and, um, he uh you have stanley tucci plays the head of security for the airport and they're trying to get him to leave the airport because the second he steps foot out of the airport uh they can arrest him but unless he does that he's not breaking it any laws. and so it's, it's a great cat jones his like love interest in it not she's a flight attendant or whatever and, and it's 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 one of those tom hanks movies where you just you're reminded why you love tom hanks because the guy is just so likable in this movie. It's a Steven Spielberg movie, you know, and it's one of the, it's just a likable movie, a not, it's not a heavy movie, just a good, heartfelt, good natured movie that I, I genuinely love. Yeah, I, I agree with you there with anything that Tom Hanks is in. It's got to have some level of quality to it because of him, because of the acting ability, the likability, and that he seems to pick his his projects pretty well. So I got to agree with you there that there's got to be at least some good stuff to this movie, even if, even if you've never heard of it, never seen it. And the way you described it, it almost kind of sounds like a comedy, you know, like the guy can't leave the airport. They're trying to get him to leave the airport. Hijinks ensue. You know, it sounds like the premise of a comedy, but maybe that's not what, you know, the, the movie's kind of going for, it sounds like. But you know, it still sounds like an, an interesting, unique kind of movie to see about this crazy situation. From your from your back and forth, I assume you've never seen it. No, the, this seems like a kind of lower key under the radar movie, at least to me. Um, yeah, I guess maybe. I mean, Spielberg, Tom Hanks, you know. Good flick. Check it out. You know, I, I was also thinking this week about how you've seen like a lot more movies than me. And I think it's because you, you watch like more new movies on a regular basis than I do. But also because like, you know, you've been around for longer. You know, it's like if I would have had the same, like however far apart we are, like five, six, seven, eight years, you know, that's a lot of movies that you have time to, to see. So I'm like, you know, one of these days I will have a couple of movies that I've seen that you haven't. So you know, hopefully the whole show isn't just, have you seen this movie? And I answer no. But then again, I'm like, okay, he does have a jump start on me. He does have years more of watching new movies than I do. So I'm like, you know what? That makes me feel a little bit better about that. Yeah, I mean, we're eight years apart or whatever. And I do have a, generally, I try and watch a movie a night. I, uh, I usually wrap up my, my work or whatever, usually around midnight. And then from midnight till like two, three in the morning, I throw on a movie and that's how I fall asleep. So I do generally, I mean, last night I started watching Ozark, so I probably won't watch a movie for until I finish Ozark. But, um, you know, it's just, yeah, I, I tend to movies. It's my calm down, man. It's my, it's my, that's my, it's my space. And, and I have a spreadsheet from 2004 of every movie I've watched since 2004. That's what type of, nerd in a jock's body i am but um i mean i think you you i believe are more into horror horror films than i am yeah i mean that's probably true different genres you probably have a little bit different taste but i like to think we both watch a variety of different genres but you know me personally i try to maybe see two maybe three new movies a week and that's not counting old favorites that i just rewatch or put on in the background but you know, just getting back to the story here for a second, you know, 
I, I, we went along the same line of thinking for the movie pick and mine kind of deals with a guy basically living a lot of his life in an airport. And I just saw this one for the first time this week and it's a movie called up in the air. And, you know, this was a Oscar nominated movie a few years back. I believe it was 2009. It came out with George Clooney among others. Uh, your favorite Anna Kendrick is in it. Uh, she does a great job. And I believe she was nominated for a few awards for, for her role in the movie, but basically to kind of sum it up for people, because um, no pun intended, this was probably a movie that flew under the radar. But, um, you know, this was basically about a guy whose job it is to go around the country firing people on behalf of their employers. So basically, he, he's on the road like over 300 days a year. So it's basically about him traveling everywhere. And he doesn't really have a, a home, per se, that he's always in and out of airports. And it's better. I promise you it's better than it sounds. Um, you know, George Clooney gives a great performance in it. I feel like he's just kind of being himself in this. He's not really a character so much as he's just George Clooney acting, which is always good. And like I said, Anna Kendrick, you know, she's in a lot of comedies, a lot of lighter movies. But this kind of gave her a chance to kind of showcase her acting a little bit. So it, and this movie did have a couple twists and turns. I'm not going to say what they are. It's not exactly a new movie, but it's one of those movies where you're not expecting a twist or turn and it has more punch that way. And then this, you know, it's not an earth shattering one like you've heard about before, like the sixth sense. But, you know, it does kind of take you for a little bit of a ride again. No pun intended, but, you know, up in the air, uh, you know, have you seen it? What do you think? I have seen it up in the air. I loved it. Um, Jason Reitman. I'm a big Jason Reitman fan. Can't wait for Ghostbusters that he's doing. Um, as you said, Anna Kendrick, I think everybody in the world has their celebrity crushes. Mine is Anna Kendrick, among others, but Anna Kendrick above all. I just absolutely love her. Um, and yeah, it was nominated. Vera Farmiga was nominated. George Clooney was nominated. Um, it actually brought Ivan Reitman you know, Jason Reitman's father, he was a producer on it. He was nominated for Best Picture for that movie. Um, luckily, I don't remember the twist at the end of that movie, so I'm going to have to watch it again because you, you, I'm trying to remember what any type of – I don't remember what it is. I can't spoil it for anybody. But um, it is – the beginning of the movie is tough to watch because it is people being fired from their jobs or whatever, and then that's, that's a real-world thing right now. Um, and I believe, if memory serves – Reitman actually, the people that Clooney fires in that movie are actual people who had recently lost their job. They're not actors. They're like, I think they put out a call to people who had recently been let go from, from careers and stuff. And those are the people in the movie. So, you know, just those interesting attentions to detail and stuff. Yeah, this movie came out, like I said, I believe around 2009. But whenever it was, it was directly after the, the Great Recession in 2008. And, you know, I think... I didn't even really know the core of what it was about when I saw it for the first time this past week, but you know, because of the themes in it and, and what the premise is, it kind of hits home for now because a lot of people are losing their jobs due to the pandemic and the upheaval of the, the country and the world. So, you know, this hits home nowadays, watching it uh, about 10 years later, a little over that about, you know, these people losing their jobs and the bottoms that they're at, but, because of that, it kind of goes in a direction and has a message to it in the movie that, you know, I'll let you figure it out for yourself and interpret it however you want. But to me, it kind of sounded like, look, you know, this may be a, a really down point in your life, but, you know, we still have people that we can rely on. It's about what you want to get out of life. And it had it had some kind of deeper themes to it, you know, by the end when you start to think about it. So a lot of people who are big comic book movie fans, I'm sure, saw the news during the week where a release date for Zack Snyder's cut of Justice League was finally announced. The project had been announced a while ago last year, but we finally got a, a concrete date that it was coming out. It's going to be an HBO Max exclusive, and I, for one, am excited for this. There's a big discussion that could go on about this, but... Let's just keep it simple and just say, are you looking forward to this? Will you see it kind of yes or no? 
And my answer for this is yes. It's coming out next month, you know, if you can believe it, finally. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm maybe not as thrilled as some other people who have been a part of this movement for as long as it's been going on, but I'm looking forward to it. I will definitely watch it. What about you? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, the big thing I'm happy about is that they're not releasing it as four individual episodes. Um, I, I'm glad I, it's going to be one long movie, kind of the way if you ever watch Hateful Eight on and Netflix, they had the extended cut. They broke it up into episodes. I didn't like it as much as just watching the movie. So the news that this is just going to be one long four-hour movie, I like that. Yeah, I, I'm definitely that way too, where I'll take a, a long movie over breaking it up into these weird uh, chunks of a stitched together movie. So, um, you know, Zack Snyder's Justice League, you know, you can read up on your own time if you want to learn more about that movement, the whole release, the Snyder cut, if you have been living under a rock and haven't really heard about that at all over the last three or four years. But, um, you know, I'm just going to get right into my movie pick. And this was a story that I thought maybe we might have the same movie. And I went with the very obvious choice of Justice League 2017. No, uh-huh. close, but no cigar. But, um, you know, again, this movie has a history and unfortunately a very troubled production for numerous reasons. Uh, just to sum it up quickly, there were a lot of um, kind of hands in the pot with people trying to shape this movie with Zack Snyder and Joss Whedon and the studio and just that created a muddled uh, product. And then uh, very unfortunately, uh, Zack Snyder's daughter committed suicide during production and he initially wanted to kind of push through and use that as a distraction to kind of take away from the tragedy in his life. But he ultimately had to step down as director and, you know, it just problems with the production, more problems kind of uh, carried on from there. And it just had a really troubled production. The final product really kind of shows that the, the mixing of different, of different tones and ideas. And it's really a shame to somebody like me, who is a big uh, DC comics fan. And, you know, this was the very first movie iteration of the justice league. And it just, it didn't quite stick the landing. Yeah, I've only ever seen the that Justice League once. Um, I, I remember being indifferent to it. It was, it was okay. I thought the villain was done pretty standard. It wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna kill the world. And no, here's the just so. Yeah, I, it was okay. I don't hate it as much as others hate it. I don't like it at all. I mean, I mean, I like it, but not. It's not like. You know, it is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. But and, if you want me, sorry. And I'm kind of the same way. I I think it's okay. I don't hate it as much as other people. I, I like some of the moments and some of the characters, but I just think when you're, when your Justice League movie, the first of its kind, is just okay, you didn't really stick the landing. You know, like like when Avengers came out, the very first Avengers And even the Avengers movies after that, they were events. People were really excited. People, you know, camped out all night for tickets. They dressed up like people were were not as enthusiastic about this one. Well, I think that's I think that's what Warner may have been banking on when they hired Josh Josh Whedon to do the Justice League, finish it out for Zack Snyder, because. Yeah, obviously he did the first first two Avenger movies, and those were massive hits, and commercials, commercially and, and critically. So I'm sure they were like, "We'll get that guy to come in, do this one, and we'll have that massive hit." But like you said, too many cooks in the kitchen muddles the water, man. So if you want me to, ju- so my movie, it ju- if you'd have just went one earlier, we would have had the same movie because I went with uh, I went with. Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice. And so the reason I went with that is because this movement for the Justice League cut is everybody's like, Zack Snyder, the jo- oh my God, it's going to be the greatest thing in the world. But if you remember, Batman versus Superman was a Zack Snyder movie. People didn't really like it that much. So why, why I don't understand this internet fandom that thinks Justice League is going to come out and be like, oh my God, it's the greatest movie ever. When they already crapped all over Batman versus Superman. And and really what it reminds me of is 
it's this example that I give for internet culture and Twitter culture. And, and, and that is, um, do you remember the movie Snakes on a Plane? Okay, so Snakes on a Plane was a movie. The, the title came out and the internet went crazy for it. And then the fan trailers made. I've had enough, these MF and Snakes on this MF and Plane. And so they actually went back, spent more money to, to, to make the movie R-rated and include that scene where Sam Jackson says that now iconic line. And before Snakes on the Plane came out, the internet had you believing this movie was going to be bigger than Star Wars. It was going to be bigger than Titanic. It was going to be the biggest movie ever made. The movie came out and bombed. And that, to me, is an, an allegory. Yeah, an analogous for what the internet is. A vocal minority that really isn't translated to the populous you know what i mean so i think you meant to say either allegory or analogy and i think you kind of but but that's besides the point so snakes on a plane uh this will make you feel old i was actually in i believe it was middle school when it came out so i didn't really get to see it in theaters i actually just saw it for the first time i think a couple months ago and i think it's great it's just like like a b movie like like a cheesy like the, the, it's in the title right there. It's snakes on a plane. What what more do you want? You know, it's it's Sam Jackson versus a bunch of snakes on a plane, and for that reason, it's it's fun to watch. But I wouldn't really expect a a great movie. But but it was entertaining for sure. But getting back to to your movie pick for you know related to the story, Batman v Superman. They had uh, Ultimate Cut, uh, what whatever it was, kind of come out afterwards and. That was the better product. And it was like, why didn't you just release this in the first place? Because I'm one of those people that liked the original. I like both cuts of the movie. The theatrical cut that we first got in theaters and then this ultimate cut that came later. But, you know, people who didn't like it seemed to like the ultimate cut when it came out later. But why didn't they just release that in the first place? I think Warner Brothers is a big reason the studio of why these movies don't stick their landings is because they interfere with them too much. You know, uh, Justice League had a mandated runtime of under two hours. The studio said you cannot make this movie longer than two hours. And that's ridiculous. How are you supposed to make this big event team up movie where you're introducing multiple new characters for the first time and juggling all these different arcs and trying to make it a good movie to make lots of money how are you going to mandate the runtime? It's like they were shooting themselves in the foot. So, you know, I'm getting on a little bit of a rant here, but it's just like some of these problems were self-inflicted by the studio for why these movies didn't succeed as much as they wanted them to. And I think that's just because they just see the bottom line. They don't say, oh, let's support the vision of the directors and make a good movie first and foremost, and then the money will come. It's simple as that. Yeah. First off, sorry, I had something in my eye. So, um, <laughs> but um, no, I agree. And I think because Batman versus Superman, the ultimate cut is rated R, and this was before R-rated uh, comic book movies came out. And we're doing really well, you know, um, Logan and Deadpool. So that's that's probably why. I mean, I, I just did this whole thing for uh, a Joe Blow movie network, look for it. Um, but I, I did a did an article on Team America World Police. And um, Trey Parker and Matt Stone were they were pressured by Paramount to make uh, the South Park movie PG-13. And luckily they were just like, no, no, it's in our contract. We get to make an R-rated movie. And, you know, they had that clout. Perhaps Zack Snyder didn't have that type of clout coming into Batman versus Superman to, to, to say, no, I, this movie will be better if I make it R. Um, um, and, and that is what happens. And a lot of times studio interference will tank a movie. Luckily, you know, you have certain studios that will let their let their filmmakers run and they make great movies. And, and there are instances of studio interference that make movies better. But yeah, Batman versus Superman, I saw it in theaters. And, you know, the age old debate for Batman versus Superman is one I agree with. I found it incredibly dumb that the thing that unites them is, oh my God, we have the same mother's name. Oh, that means it is so dumb. Yeah, the Martha moment is very polarizing for people who watch the movie. I didn't mind it. I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. But 
I just thought it was okay. I didn't really mind it. And they really kind of hammered that home in the movie. They really, when they led up to that, they really reinforced their, their mom's names a couple of times. So they kind of laid the groundwork a lot for it in the movie. But I didn't mind that. But again, it was just, did that really need to be there? Did that really need to be the thing to stop Batman from killing Superman? Probably not. It's a little ridiculous. But, you know... I think, again, this is a good exercise in studio interference, how much they should have a say in the final product of the movie, because if they let the directors kind of see their vision through to the end, then money will follow if it's good and if it's of good quality and people like it, you know, and it's like Warner Brothers is kind of admitting to their mistake by having this Zack Snyder cut Justice League come out because they've invested more money and they've said, we'll let you make the movie how you want. So they, so them doing that is kind of admitting that, yeah, we, we kind of messed up on our end with the first round of Justice League back in 2017. We, we told Zach, we, we want to do it this way and it tanked. So, oh, maybe we should have listened to you in the first place. I'm hopeful that um, it's successful to the fact that, you know, they're starting to go around with the uh, air cut of Suicide Squad. I would really like to see that. I love David Ayer as a filmmaker. Uh, I was lucky enough back in the day when I lived in L.A., I saw a uh, advanced screening of End of Watch with David Ayer there, and Anna Kendrick was actually sitting like three rows behind me. If I had, if I was the man, I would have been like, what's up, Anna Kendrick? Would you like to grab a coffee? I did not. And thus, our love story was, was not to be. But the David Ayer, you could tell, man, he was just introducing End of Watch, which is a phenomenal uh, uh, a movie about cops in South Southern uh, Los Angeles. Um, the guy has a passion for for his films, and you know he he wrote the original Fast and the Furious. Uh, he's wrote in a lot of harsh times with Christian Bale. You know he's he's a, he's a great filmmaker, and he's he said you know Suicide Squad didn't turn out the way he envisioned it really because of studio interference and. I think I've said in a previous episode, even though it's of the Joker performances, it's the least favorite. I still enjoy Jared Leto's Joker performance. And I want to see, he says the Joker that he had envisioned is not anything like what was on the screen for Suicide Squad. I want to see what his version of the Joker, his true version of the Joker was, which apparently we're going to get to see some of in, in Justice League because they already touted like a little image of him and Jared Leto apparently went back and did reshoots for it. So I, I am looking forward to it and I'm, I'm glad it's next month. Man. I'm glad I don't have to wait too much longer to see it and to wrap up this thing. So normally what our wrap up is, is we try and talk about new release movies that hopefully the both of us have seen. So we can kind of give a good back and forth to close out the episode. Um, as I said before, I, I generally try and watch a, a movie a, a, a night. And so this past week I actually watched uh, two new movies one was The Little Things with Denzel Washington, Rami Malek, and Jared Leto. Um, one of those, you know, earlier you said Seven is up on your list of, of movies that you love. Little Things, if to compare it to a movie, would be like, a, it's not as good as Seven, because Seven is one of the greatest movies ever made. But it's still an enjoyable watch. And especially now, over the past couple of days, with Jared Leto surprisingly picking up Golden Globe nominations and SAG nominations, it is... I, I didn't. I thought his performance was phenomenal. I'm a Jared Leto fan, obviously with the Joker, and I've seen him in concert and everything. And, but um, his performance is phenomenal. But this is a movie that's benefiting from the delayed pa pandemic uh, uh, eligibility, and uh, it's it's pretty. I'm I'm happy to see him in there, even though there's an actor named Paul Racy from a movie called Sound of Metal who I'd rather have seen got nominations. But um, if if you like just old school 90s serial killer cop movies, it's a good watch. Um, Denzel, you're never going to go wrong with Denzel. Did you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I, um, I've, I've read some reviews about the little things. And, you know, to people who may not have heard of this movie, this is one of those first in line. Not the first one, but one of these movies that uh, Warner and HBO Max are trying their their joint release with where they release it on HBO max and then it's in theaters for a short time too. So that that's another discussion about that model. I don't think that's a good idea because it kills theaters, but, um, but about the movie, 
I read a review where somebody called it a, a not as successful seven, you know, kind of like that. It was like seven, but not as good. And that really turned me off to it because I hold seven in such high regard that I think, okay, this movie just sounds like a cheap imitation of that. Why would I waste my time and watch it? Look, I love Denzel and I think Jared Leto is a good actor when, you know, he gets a good role. And I'll be honest, him being nominated for this movie, for this role from for a couple of awards has intrigued me a little bit more than maybe I'll go back and watch it. But I'll be honest, it's not high on my list right now. If it's a cheap Im imitation of seven, that doesn't make me want to watch it that much. So one, if you do want to watch it, remember you only have 30 days before it's off HBO max Two, um, 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 the script. So the guy who wrote this movie, um, actually wrote the script before seven ever came out. It just sat on his shelf for so long. So it did come out before he did write it before seven just happened. Seven came out, became a classic movie. I, you know, you, you have a stack of movies to watch. I'll say within the 30 day time frame. It's not a bad way to kill two hours. It's dark. And Jared Leto, he's good, man. And the nominations, surprise nominations. I am an awards person. I love the awards. So they were, when I heard his name called, extremely surprising, but deserved. And so check it out. And so the other new movie of the week I watch is another uh, awards contender. It's the first movie directed by Regina King, who's a phenomenal actress, an Academy Award winner a few years back for uh, If Beale Street Could Talk. That's One Night in Miami. And this was a movie I sat down to watch. And I was thinking it was going to be kind of boring because the movie's just about four guys in a hotel room. I finished that movie thinking it was one of the best movies of the year. It is phenomenal. The script is phenomenal. If you don't know what it's about, it's about after Muhammad Ali at the time named Cassius Clay. He becomes the heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, it's a, They go back to a motel room, and it's uh, Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, Jim Brown. And they're all in the room talking essentially about race relations in the world at the time. And, and, and Malcolm X is trying to, to get Muhammad Ali and Sam Cooke and Jim Brown to these, these, these more famous people to come along with his movement in the, in, in kind of the nation of Islam and, and, and to, to really delve into black culture at the time. And it is such a phenomenal movie. It is. I immediately, I went to eBay and I bought the script because I, I want to read that script because I think for a movie to to be that good just based on it, it's essentially based on the writing and the performances and, and the, the directing, obviously, because Regina King and doing that movie, it's her first movie, as I just said, it's it's and it's so well paced. It's so it's a great. movie. I believe she will be nominated. She'll probably be the first ever female black female nominated for best director. And it deserves because it is a phenomenal movie. I'll definitely take the the recommendations into consideration. I, I've seen spots and commercials for this one, and it, it looks like a good kind of history, true story movie, you know? So, like, I'll, I'll think about it. I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's it's an Amazon uh, Studio exclusive? Yeah. Okay, exactly. so, you know, it makes it a little bit difficult these days to kind of, you know, watch some of these movies that are on different platforms, you know, HBO Max, Amazon, so... You know, do with it what you will. Check it out if you can. So, but the little things is a good segue into the movie that you wanted to talk about at the end of this episode, which is Joker, because Jared Leto, Joker, Joaquin Phoenix, Joker. You know, you see the connection there. But you know, with not a lot of major new releases coming out. Again, we just kind of talked about the little things and One Night in Miami, but. You know, Joker is still a, a newer release and it lets us kind of talk about a movie that is a little bit newer and still new to the scene since there aren't really a lot of major new releases going on right now instead of just talking about an old movie that one of us saw for the first time this week. So I know you're a big fan of Joker. I love Joker too, but, you know, what do you kind of want to explain or, you know, talk about specifically with it? I, I just, you know, I, I watched it again this week after not seeing I, it was the so when Joker first came out last year, it was the first movie I ever saw twice in theaters on the same night. I saw it five times in theaters overall, but that I, the night it came out, I saw it in the Dolby theater 
And then immediately after, I bought a ticket for the IMAX screening because it was that damn good. And that was the first movie I've ever done, only movie I've ever done that with. Um, and it, it counts as the uh, movie I've seen the most in theaters um, five times. And um, it was, it, it just hit me, man. That movie is a masterpiece. And Joaquin Phoenix in it is, even though for me, Heath Ledger's performance in The Dark Knight, for my money, is the single greatest performance ever. I rank Joaquin Phoenix's up there. They're both top. Heath Ledger's number one. He, Joaquin Phoenix is in the top five of all time performances. And it's it's interesting. You know, there's talk about them doing a sequel, and I don't know if I actually want a sequel, even though I absolutely love it. Yeah, I mean, because a sequel will perhaps ruin the ambiguity of it, and I generally hate ambiguity. But this movie, the ambiguity is is pretty perfect because there's certain scenes, you know, in the beginning, the first part where, where Arthur Fleck kills the men on the train, he has a six-shooter gun, and if you count the shots, he shoots eight times. I don't think that was a movie mistake. There's something to that. The end of the movie, he's got the bloody footprints. What's that all about? But even before that, man, the scene after the late night scene where he stands on top of the car and does the bloody smile. It's a top five scene all time for me. The music swells up. The scene scene is so perfect. And I I just, I love that scene so much. Yeah. I think that scene where he, he does the the smile on top of the car with the, the crowd around him, whether you think it's in his head or not, you know, that, that for me, that was a scene where seeing that in theaters, as I was watching it, I knew it would, it would become an iconic scene. And that's not always the case. Usually when you leave the theater and you're thinking about the movie that you just saw and you're like, oh, you know, this part might become an iconic scene or something doesn't become an iconic scene until down the line or when it's, you know, reached a wider audience if a movie didn't have a make a ton of money in its release. But, you know, that was a scene where as I was watching it, I'm. I thought this is going to be an iconic scene, like with the whole thing he was doing. And you're right. I think I really hope they don't make a sequel first. Like you said, for ambiguity reasons, again, I'm not a huge fan of that either, but if it's done right and it's done well, then I'm all for it. And it was done well here. And also I'm just never a fan of just Hollywood, not knowing when to let movies just rest, you know, Joker was a great one-off original. Just let it stand on its own. Don't sequel it to death and ruin the integrity of the first film in hindsight. Just just, just let it be. Let it be, please. Yeah, and to kind of close up the conversation was when this movie first came out, you and I had pretty in-depth conversations about safety. Because if you remember, this movie was... A lot of people thought this was going to lead to a violence in the movie theater based off the topic. And, and we had that conversation where we were like, do we go see this movie opening weekend? Do we wait or not? And, and you know, ultimately it was much ado about nothing. I mean, did, do you remember how you felt going to see the movie or any of that stuff the first time? Did that? Yeah, I remember that being a little bit of a concern. And that's what some reviewers were saying, too, that this movie was going to inspire a bad message or that it, it would have encouraged people to be be violent around it. And look, in hindsight, that was all a bunch of hogwash. That was it was just silly nonsense. But, you know, I think whenever maybe there was a dark movie like this that kind of came out that had a conflicted, twisted character in it that had some message of violence i think that's just always going to be said about a movie like this and i think because they knew this one was going to be seen by a lot of people because it was a like a comic book movie it was a superhero movie it was going to be seen by a lot of people that more eyeballs were going to see it and maybe more people would get ideas but i think this is this was just in hindsight a classic case of people overreacting to a movie that is a little bit dark yeah, it was just media media frenzy. They had to fill their story, so they created a fake, fake BS stories about the violence. But ultimately, I mean, it went on to become highest grossing R-rated movie of all time, first R-rated movie to ever gross over a billion dollars. So 
Bring out the light. And I like that it's from Todd Phillips, man. You know, Todd Phillips known for the hangover, known for comedies, and he comes out with this just great movie, man. So that's the Joker. All right, so that will do it for this week's episode. Um, like I said in the past, hopefully you uh, there's some movies on here that maybe you haven't seen. And you're like, oh, check it out. Chairman of the board, man. I'm telling you, check it out. It's hilarious. But, uh, you know, new movies, little things. One Night in Miami is going to be a big Oscar player this year, so I, I definitely recommend checking that out. And, uh, you know, Justice League, maybe we'll talk about that further after we both get to see it on that'll probably be our new movie of the week after March 18th. And, uh, yeah, hope everybody enjoyed this episode, man. So anything you want to wrap up with there, Mitch? No, I just want to say, as usual, if you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening to the audio on Spotify or whatever platform it may be, just thank you so much for tuning in. Um, you know, we're not really trying to reach an audience with the show. It'd be great if we kind of drew an audience, but we're really just doing this to have good conversations about movies. And hopefully we spark some ideas in other people and get them to talk about it with their friends and people maybe talk about it movies with us so we want to say thank you for tuning in but you know we're not uh, kind of chasing you here we're we're just trying to have a good talk about about movies just just two regular guys two movie bros so thanks everybody for watching listening you know we'll be back again monday 10 a.m eastern again with a new episode next week all right thanks everybody take it easy